All right, so I'm here to talk about BlueCat. Who's heard of BlueCat so far? Awesome. Okay. Uh, so pretty much, I'm a, my name is Joseph Paul Cohen. I'm a PhD student at UMass Boston. Um, so I do this is kind of a side thing, uh, based like a cybersecurity computer science education. Um, I do a lot of machine learning and computer vision stuff. So it's kind of dual tracks, right? So this is this is uh, this is the fun stuff. Um, so I want to just have some questions to kind of gauge the audience, right? So how many of you guys have used the Bluetooth API, whether it's Blues or OS X or Windows or whatever? Okay, so it's not that many. Okay, um, who's used NetCat to talk to a web server? All right, so that's that's half. Okay, um, who's created an outrageously complex Bash script that to do some task? Okay, so these are kind of all going to come together in this talk. Uh, so it seems like everyone's kind of well versed in that. So the overview of the, the sections of this are going to talk about uh, streams and how they're awesome and fundamental, right? Uh, and then how Blue Cat, how you can replace Blue Cat in line with wherever you use Netcat, right? So any situation you can think about using Netcat over an IP address, you can use Blue Cat. You just kind of replace uh, the IP addresses with Max, right? And then you just have to be in range. Um, and we also have Blue Cat uh, as a Bluetooth end map, so it's like a uh, we do scanning and uh, I do scanning and uh, service discovery uh, uh, functions, right? And then uh, basically, I'm only going to talk about RFCOM and L2CAP. Those are the only things that really like are understood by BlueCat because they kind of make sense. You have port numbers and you can you can talk to them directly. Um, and then uh, we're going to look at some devices with BlueCat and see like how you ex you know examine other devices with BlueCat, how to make pro how to prototype some stuff really quick, uh, some stats I've generated while scanning. And then, uh, if we have time, the architecture of how Blue Cat, Blue Cat uh, works on, on uh, like tons of architectures, right? Um, so first, streams are awesome, right? So I hope everyone agrees. Um, you can take something like a file and you can turn it into a stream and you can pipe it into something like VLC. And you can kind of abstract everything that has to do on a computer to stream uh, to a stream. Um, so once it becomes a stream, really don't care where it goes. Um, but you know, we can we, we use streams every day when we talk to Pal Talk. So every time you go on, <laughs> oh, okay. I'll just take it. Okay. <laughs> well, look, I was supposed to. It was supposed to be on, but um, I was. I didn't want to broadcast my Mac to everyone, uh, but I did when I was pairing with. So anyway, um, so you have a computer, and it turns into a stream, and then you can talk to tel pal, pal talk, uh, and then back, right? So uh, that's how that kind of communication will work. Like most things are based there. So you can put some kind of block in the middle, and then you don't care what happens on the other side, uh, you know, inside this block, right? Um, the computer just talks to this thing, and at the other side, it's going to come out to PalTalk. And then from that side, uh, the responses go into this, you know, blob, and then come out the other side to you. And you don't really have to care what's inside of there, right? It gets abstracted with all the uh, layers, right? So this is how the internet would work, right? You send some stream, it goes through a series of tubes, and then it comes out the other side, and you really don't care. Um, so you can take some really complicated process like routing all the way across the internet and just um, forget about it, right? Have someone else kind of take that initiative right? and you just deal with higher level application stuff. So you can extract really complicated things and just kind of ignore that they exist um, no matter how dysfunctional they are. Okay. So um, to really appreciate the uh, usage of, of just talking to these services, right? Um, we can take a look at HTTP. Uh, so, just want to go over the simple. Make sure everyone's on the same page. So, HTTP is pretty awesome, right? It's simple. It's human readable. Uh, you can kind of intuitively know what's going on just by reading like some traces, right? Um, Debugging is easy. You can kind of look right at it in any kind of debugger, and you can you still don't have to read the HTTP spec. You can see all this stuff. Um, you can encapsulate it, right? The stream and anything, and you can custom. You can kind of like add custom stuff, right? So it's not really uh, so picky. Uh, um, with what inputs and outputs it does, right? So it's very forgiving, right? So here's a diagram I didn't make. Um, from a browser, you can uh, send an HTTP request to a server, and you get a response. And these are just uh, like a, a, you can think of it as a tiny text file, a bunch of streams, a bunch of strings, um, and then you get back the same thing, right? And that's the basic interaction, right? So you, you can you can experiment. You just type the string get, and then you get back whatever response um, in the content. So Here's one for DEF CON, right? So we do get forward slash HTTP. Um, we tell it we want the DEF CON host, and uh, it's going to send back OK, 
with all these other HTTP headers, and then it's going to send us back the HTML, right? So we can take a look at the underlying protocol by just looking at the ports that it goes over, right? Based on just um, the, the port on the server that, that is for HTTP, right? So that's nice to inspect. And then if you think about it, like, this is this, the image of the matrix, right? Is, is kind of true, right? Like, everything's just streams that are flowing all the time back and forth, right? Um, so at some point, maybe this will be how everything looks. Um, when you start looking at everything. So maybe, maybe everyone's already there, um, most likely. So uh, what is Blue Cat, right? So, so what, what, what is the point of this, right? So there are three main things that I've been able to kind of come up with reasons why. You have a debugging tool for Bluetooth applications. So if you're writing a Bluetooth app, uh, you can uh, use it to debug your own application. You can see what's going on. Like, uh, how, did you modify the service record properly um, so that other devices can see that record, right? Uh, and then whatever process is handling the socket on the other side, it, you, you don't want to have like a, you know, a full-blown client ready, right? You might just want to have like a makeshift client to see what is going on. Or if you want to like do some sort of um, uh, emulation uh, or testing with uh, inputs that you wouldn't normally put into uh, your client application, right? So if you kind of want to um, fuzz your own app, right, you can do that with this and it's not a big overhead, right? Device, you can use it as a device exploration tool, right? So, um, other people's devices, other people's um, services that are written, right? So your phone services, because there are tons of them. Um, and they vary on different types of phones. You have old phones with insecure services, new phones with more sophisticated services, right? And then you have va varying manufacturers have their own services, right? Um, so you can look at how those services work and like send random data and try to debug the, the protocol that's there, right? Um, and then you can record nearby devices using scripts. Right? So you can just like scan and kind of uh, do it in an nmap fashion, right? So kind of output, so I have a format to output this thing to a CSV file, uh, so you can kind of just aggregate tons of information about Bluetooth devices, which is interesting and I have some cool graphs later. Um, so you can also use it as a component in building other applications. Um, so you can use the, just like you'd use Netcat to prototype an application, you can actually use Bluecat to prototype an application and you don't have to care so much about the Bluetooth layer, right, because you're handling that kind of while well, it's deployed, and then your service runs as your own thing, and it just cares about like standard in and standard out. Doesn't know that it's talking over the, uh, you know, the uh, RF. All right, so simple inline replacement for a, a Netcat example, right? So we have Netcat, some machine name and a port, and that's going to connect to some server listening with Netcat on port 123, right? And then you're going to have a, a pipe going this way, and it comes out that side, right? So that's like the um, main kind of demo of Netcat, right? Uh, so we can do the same thing with Bluecat. So we listen uh, on um, RFCOM channel 4, and then we connect uh, to this, uh, this MAC address on RFCOM channel 4, and it establishes that same connection, right? And you can do the same thing. Like you can send music uh, or movies. The throughput's like 100K, so it's not, it's not too good. Um, but it does, does work with music, right? Maybe not flat. Okay, so... Then we can compare with, uh, with Nmap, right? So Nmap's gonna scan a bunch of stuff, which is uh, um, very useful. Everyone, everyone knows about that. So what's the equivalent for Bluecat, right? So we have kind of two things. We can scan for device names, which is what I was doing earlier, scanning everyone's device names. And then you have um, this kind of output. So here we have a timestamp, uh, the device name, whether we're paired with it, um, and then whether the, the, the session's encrypted. And then what's fallen off there is like, uh, I can output the RSS ID the, the um, RSSI uh, of the, the connection, right? Um, all right, so you, you can go farther in depth, right? You can uh, list the services of each of those devices, right? So it lets you actually expect the stuff that's, that's kind of running on that device. So you can think about these the same way you think about an IP address and ports, right? It's the same thing. You have uh, a MAC address, IP, and then you have these channel numbers or PSMs for the L2 CAP protocol, um, and those are, those are outlaid um, on the right. So this thing returns the entire URL which says that we're going to talk over the B2 L2 CAP um, protocol on PSM19 on that Mac, right? So you can just copy and paste that right back into BlueCat uh, and connect to it. So I'll go over that in more detail. Uh, you can also brute force scan. So this takes a long time, uh, the way that I've done it. Um, so maybe it's faster with, with other implementations, but this is, this is the cross-platform version. So um, if we scan this thing, we can scan RF channel, RFCOM channels first. We can see that we have a bunch of open channels. So even if they're not advertised in the service discovery, we can still find them this way, right? 
And then if we scan L2 cap channels, you can actually look at all the channels that are open um, from ev every possible L2 cap channel. So even if they're not valid, it'll still try to see if that stack will allow it. Um, and this goes up to a, a very high number, but I've never really seen anything over, you know, um, uh, I don't know, like a, like a hundred. All right, great. So for the past three days, I've been walking around with my bag, scanning all the Bluetooth devices. Um, and these are all their names. I put a nice word bubble thing, right? So all this specific stuff is really tiny. But there are a lot of iPhones, MacBook Pros, and Blackberries. Um, yeah, do you guys all see? Who sees their machine on this thing? Who got invited to this talk during the week? <laughs> right, nobody? No, nobody's afraid to raise their hand? What? Oh, yeah, I see the scoreboard. I said that was fun. You guys left your Bluetooth on. Okay. <laughs> Who saw the scoreboard uh, to advertise for the Blue Cat talk? I got one? A couple? Okay. It was a short amount of time. Okay, so, uh, so I got statistics on this, right? So there are 92 unique names that I found, right? Um, and sometimes, the, you know, devices won't send names. They kind of, they kind of lag. Um, and then, they're, then, they're, then they disappear. Uh, but you definitely get their MAC address. So I found 126 unique MACs. Uh, just broadcasting. So there, there are tons of other ways to find, find device max, but this is the blatant one. I didn't even think it would work. I was like, no one will leave their Bluetooth on, uh, you know, less even discoverable, because these are, these are discoverable Bluetooth devices. I thought I, thought I was going to find like two and then be at the hotel, like, you know, just staying, not knowing. Um, so I sent this 100, these 126 max, 13,000 pairing requests with an invite to my talk. So um, that, was, that was funny. The people clapping are the ones that were invited? Okay. So the reason I could do that is because you can script BlueCat. That's the point, right? So I could write a program and that's a pain in, you know, pain in the ass. I could say that here. Um, but so bash scripting just makes everything so easy. You don't need to care so much. Uh, so, so if your name's on here, um, you have a, I think this is the coolest names out of all the names. Just to, just to prove to myself that these were not hotel guests. Um, so maybe the DOD is staying here, right? So I don't know. Uh, so, okay, let's talk about URI monkeys, right? So this, this little URL that I was talking about before, um, it kind of says everything that we want to know about the service, right? So you can think about like HTTP and HTTPS as equivalent design, right? Um, all right, so we pretty much have three that I care about in this program that to use that may kind of make sense. Uh, and then the object exchange is kind of pushing it to what this program kind of does. So the BTSPP, the Bluetooth Serial Port profile, for, which is also called RFCOM, makes the most sense for this kind of NCAT replacement, right? It's, it's a, a serial port protocol. It's meant to take stuff that used to run over serial ports and make them wireless, right? So uh, that one's easy. Uh, L2 cap kind of uh, is a little bit different. You kind of just have fixed width buffers that you, you kind of send over and you negotiate like a size. Uh, so you can achieve the same thing, um, but it's, you know, it's kind of exactly the same thing. So it's kind of redundant. Um, and then you have an object exchange, which is when you send files back and forth. Um, so these three monkier things, on the, if, you, if you have these in the URL string, then that's, that's what they'll correspond to. All right? And you kind of have this weird Bluetooth stack, right? So see RFCOM, which is a BTSPP, and then L2CAP. So RFCOM sits on top of L2CAP. Uh, and then you have stuff that's kind of completely out of the range of BlueCat, which is like uh, audio. So that kind of stinks. Um, and then the other, LMP, I, I don't know what that is. So um, uh, you kind of have limited, limited range on the stack of Bluetooth, right? Let's go over uh, these pro pro profiles a little bit more. So the SPP profile is uh, designed to emulate RS-232 serial ports, right? It's a serial port protocol. Um, so it kind of has the same major attributes of TCP. So um, you're, you're expected to have in order uh, delivery of all your messages. Uh, and if it's not delivered, you'd expect that it would retry or just like kill the connection, right? So you kind of have some guarantees with it, right? Um, it only has about 30 ports. Uh, depending on the stack, this, this like varies what you can use. Um, and then if you think of, if you know port map, right? Um, with the old run NIS, right? Would advertise on port map. Uh, it kind of works the same way. You can't really be guaranteed that you're going to have a port. So you can ask for something and then if someone else is using it, it just says, no, I'll put you on a higher, a higher port. Um, so that's kind of a drawback, which is why this, you need, kind of need the scanning to like look at what's, what port it actually ends up on, right? Um, but it's the same consistently on a device. So if you run BlueCat on a device and you get channel four, 
Uh, it'll probably always be channel four unless you like, you know, reflash the device, put some other services on it. Um, okay, L2 caps underneath RFCOM. So you can make, you can make it unreliable to UDP, but that's not really in the interest of this stuff. Um, and then uh, it has a, the default maximum packet size is 672 bytes, so you can kind of send them over in chunks. Um, and then RFCOM sits on top of L2 cap. So there's a, a PSM or a channel number um, three in L2 cap, which is kind of RFCOM runs over all that. Uh, and it has way more ports number, way, way more port numbers. Uh, so I scan up to six, um, 65,000, uh, and then at somewhere people advertise like 40,000, and it's, it's all like the odd numbers, which is weird that you just have odd port numbers, but uh, it's a weird protocol. Okay, so here's a list out. So you have TCP, UDP, we all know those. Uh, RFCOM, we have one to 30, we call those channels. L2 cap, we, have, we call it a, P, a PSM, or a protocol service multi, multiplexer. Um, and then the odd numbered, so you have like a reserved at the base, so these are the interesting ones, most part. Um, and that's 4,000 of them, and then it, <coughs> the spec says it goes up to 32. So it's kind of the lay of the land there. So you can, just a side note, you can look up MAC addresses the same way you'd look up IP MAC addresses on network adapters. Uh, so that's, that's kind of, it gives you more information, but nothing really aligns properly. Like you, you'll, it doesn't say Apple Incorporated like it would with the network MAC. So it doesn't really tell you a lot of information. All right. <clears throat> so getting back to Bluetooth a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> we can use the dash E option, which is like from NCAT. So here's an example. So we have two actors in this. We have the green and the blue, right? So we're launching BlueCat with verbose dash V, which gives us this, you know, pound comment line. Uh, dash L for listen, and it's going to choose any channel. And then we're going to do dash E for bin bash. Right, so upon connection, I want to execute bin bash and set up standard in and standard out <coughs> to be wired right there. So we can then <coughs> active two, the blue, blue computer will list the services on that first machine. And it outputs that there's something listed on channel four. Uh, so we can connect to that. When we connect to that, I type hi and it's, it shoved that command to bash and bash that out, you know, there's a program in hi. Um, so that's kind of a cool usage. So you can kind of have a, a point to point remote access to some <coughs> device, which is kind of cool if you like hang a Raspberry Pi in the corner um, and then you can just connect to it without a wire. <coughs> so I'm going to get a little more in depth on bl the Bluetooth plumbing, right? How this kind of, how this stuff can kind of be put, put together. <coughs> so we have this basic Bluetooth connection at the top, BlueCat. We connect to some URL, which is the identifying the second BlueCat process running somewhere else. And they're going to exchange the standard in and send it out like you normally would. So on the left, we have a terminal. And on the right, we did the dash E option. So it's just going to pipe the standard out from the terminal to the standard in in bin bash. So you kind of have remote control service <clears throat> oh, over Bluetooth. Right. Uh, and this works the other way. I just tested it. Um, so you can do a dash E on this side, and you can like have one process uh, connect and then launch a service immediately when it connects to the server. And on the other side, it connects to the same process or a different process. Uh, so you can have two processes talk to each other over a Bluetooth link and they never have to know anything about Bluetooth. All right. So when you, if we start, so I'm going to go through a bunch of devices that we just kind of like, you know, give a brief overview of how they would work. Uh, Bluetooth has profiles. So when we kind of look at this stuff, you can see profiles in these certain types of devices. So we're looking from a specific angle with BlueCat. Um, but that's not really the way that devices want to look at each other. They want to look at each other and say, you're a phone, so you must have these, uh, you must have a hands-free mode, right? Um, and then you can identify those with UUIDs and device classes. So a device class will say, I'm a, you know, a um, laptop. So I'm going to have laptop-like services that you can see if I have and then go, go, go forward with that. So it's really crazy the way, the way that they look up each other. But underneath, if you just look at it from a, a raw implementation point of view, we have RFCOM and L2 cap channels, or PSMs, that uh, you can connect to for these services. <clears throat> and like in the case of like an audio gateway, <clears throat> sorry, it'll go to a, another service that has like voice. Um, so it's kind of a, a collection of services on Bluetooth that compose a profile. So if we start looking at something like a printer. So we scan this thing, we get a Mac, and it's an Office Jet 6300. Um, we can see that them, it has a micro link nicking it on the Bluetooth. So that doesn't tell us anything. Um, so unless you know that Microlink sells to HP, and then you can tell us it's HP or something, right? But they probably don't exclusively. Um, 
So it's hard to really gain information that way. Um, <clears throat> but we can look at the services that are listed here. So we obviously know it's a printer because we can just read the name. Uh, and then the device class will be, we'll say I'm a printer. And uh, we can see that it has a serial port listed here, right? So it's a <clears throat> on channel one. So we can just try to connect to that with Blue Cat and type some stuff and see what kind of error it gives us. Um, Bluetooth really isn't good for giving errors. It, oh, or the, the, when people implement Bluetooth services, they just don't respond instead of give like an error message. So it's a little bit tougher. So we can um, type Blue Cat dash URL and just put that, that URL in there with the Mac and the channel number and uh, connect directly to this thing and it turns out this printer, so Blue Cat launches and it doesn't ask for authentication, it's usually the other side. So you would, <clears throat> you'd connect to this printer and the printer would, would be like, all right, yeah, it's fine, I don't need to pair with you. Um, and it will just let you connect to the socket and print out. That's not the case with a lot of devices, um, but printers completely anonymous access, right? Um, so. So I messed with people with this first. I found out when like a bunch of stationery was used um, and uh, people were kind of mad. So let's look at the next phone. So this is uh, Alcatel, right? So let's, uh, let's take a look at what we look at. Um, gives us the device name, some audio gateway, object exchange, dial up networking, right? So we can use it as a modem. Uh, and then we just have a serial port. Um, so if we just connect to the serial port, um, <clears throat> This wasn't as easy as this, but you can, you can connect to it and let's say, let's say I, so I had to pair with this phone, right? So we're pretty safe unless we pair, but the, I guess there are pairing flaws that people have been telling me for the last couple of days. Um, so we can just type the AT Hayes connection um, or the commands to this thing uh, and we can get the device manufacturer, the model, so those are all um, easy uh, or you can just look at it from the name and we get the third one, it's because there's a date uh, that it's talking to me. Uh, and at this point, I, I could have put more in, but the guy that I was playing with his phone, he like shut off his phone once he started that. Once I got excited, I was like, these commands are working. This is awesome. This is, this is hard to find phones that you can actually do this to because this was a really old phone. Uh, new phones don't, aren't, aren't, aren't friendly to people who want to just poke around on them. Probably for good reason. All right. Uh, so we can look at anything that's Bluetooth, right? With this. So if you look at a Wiimote, um, we see that there, it's, it's service records kind of weird. So it returns these records, but they're empty. It doesn't say any information. Uh, so maybe it's trying to hide those things. Um, but we can see up there that we have three services listed. Um, and one's obvious, I think it's the port of uh, channel 11, or uh, PSM 11. And then when we scan it, we actually find that it's 1, 11, and 13. But, so one's kind of a default one. Uh, so 11 and 13 are the ones we can, we can talk to this thing on. Uh, but people have kind of completely reverse engineered the Wiimote stuff. Uh, but if you were starting from scratch, you could do it like this and then kind of start sending stuff to those ports. All right, so we can take a look at the Nexus 4. All right, so we list the services on this. Uh, we see we have a headset gateway, no serial port protocol, so we can't have fun with it. No uh, dial-up modem, uh, so we can't mess with that either. Um, so the fun ones to look at are these BT SPPs. So you, <clears throat> they're usually text-based, right, ASCII-based. Um, except for an example I'll show in a minute. Um, <clears throat> so we can try to connect to one of those. So let's, let's do the hands-free one, right? It's the, it's the only one I could really find anything to, to, to look at. Um, so if you kind of Google that name, you can find profiles and the, the profiles will tell you kind of what some sort of established protocol for it is. But the documentation is pretty bad and not uniform across all the manufacturers. Um, so I, I got this thing, I, I kind of connected to it and the first thing I type now when I connect to the serial port protocol is I type AT or AT plus. Uh, and have it give me an error, right? And then if you say something really weird like AT star, uh, it, it will just kick you off. So um, to get it to give me an error is, is a first sign that there's somebody on the other side listening uh, that we can try to, there's some commands that must do something. Um, so after reading this, the, reading all the profile stuff, we can see that the hands free profile has a lot of AT commands, um, like uh, the one that, that's the coolest one is dials a member. So you can, this actually, this, this actually works on the Nexus 4. You can do, ATD and then like five 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 whatever, uh, or I don't know maybe an expensive phone phone number, um, and it will uh, you'll call it right. So you can also like list the number and then list all the services that are there. Right. So there is a way to talk to these things. They're just obscure and they don't really advertise all that stuff. Right. So it's a little bit difficult to kind of get information from these things. So a thing that I did uh, with Alex Whitmore like. An hour ago, two hours ago, was look at the YAP because so I didn't know what it was. I thought it was access point. That's like kind of intuitively how I 
thought it was, and I guess it's the iPod accessory protocol. So I don't like I don't like iPhones, but um, <laughs> so uh, the goal is like, how can you stop play stop start and control the auto tracks um, <clears throat> on uh, on on the phone, right? Like that would be that would be pretty cool if you can just connect from your computer or like write a full fledged app that was all software based that would interact with this. Um, and it turns out that there's a chance that it could be the same interaction as the standard UART in the Apple connector. So if you just wire it up into that. Uh, so that's the kind of the hypothesis. And it turns out so that they're, they're the um, regular way you do this over the hardwire, right? This is the, the same um, packet thing for saying, I want you to play, right? I want you to stop. Um, so that's like well documented for the, for the hardline stuff. Uh, but sadly, it turns out that um, Apple has like a Weird authentication coprocessor that's required to um, attach to this process, so that makes it different than the actual wireline, uh, which makes it uh, kind of un 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 undoable to with BlueCat unless we can kind of process this stuff fast enough. Uh, but <clears throat> more research will be needed for this stuff. All right. So the next section is rapid prototyping with BlueCat. So if you just want to um, make something really quick with Bash scripts, right? So how to prototype. So this presentation was supposed to be given with a Bluetooth presenter um, that all the only thing on the phone would be a, uh, an app that just sends characters over a socket, right? So I, I press a button, it just sends a B or an F, right? Um, and on a laptop, there's something that's listening and it goes like into a script that's dispatching all the characters as they come in and will um, respectively press back or forward to move my slides. So that's the, the basis of it. So we can go over how this, how this works. It's, it's like a few lines. So we uh, launch BlueCat. We do a keep alive, uh, verbose, to keep, to, to stay on the, <coughs> to connect to this URL, which is my phone on channel four. Um, and then when we, when we receive a connection, we just throw it to dispatcher.sh, which <coughs> simply looks like this, right? So we just well read input. Um, if the input's an F, echo forward and then Press the key for four. Um, so it, it did work great all weekend, uh, and, it, and it, so you can do other stuff. You can you can say on any input, you can like filter on different words and have it do anything. So it's kind of like the sky's the limit with anything you want to control on this device. Um, so that's kind of the basic way of uh, prototyping, right? So you, you can any way you can think of in the future to kind of uh, use that stream in that kind of same concept. It's pretty easy to do. So uh, I've scanned for like over the course of three months uh, from the same desktop next to a computer lab uh, every five minutes. And um, every single Bluetooth device that was at the visible, uh, I captured and stored and then wanted to run data analysis on it later. Um, so specific, you know, uh, I happen to write BlueCat so it opens in a CSV format. So we just end up having tons of CSV files and we can just import those in a database um, or in R, which I did, and uh, analyze some stuff. Right, so uh, kind of a shout out to R, it's awesome. So we can just read this file um, and then uh, filter based on the date uh, to convert them all to dates and then you make a histogram based on dates uh, and break them all up by um, into a hundred bins, right? So we get this thing. So this is uh, February to April. And we can see uh, <clears throat> this should be numbers, but I, I, didn't, I didn't go back and gener regenerate this thing. So this is, in the upwards, it's pretty high. This is like 2,000 scans, uh, the, the, the magnitude of this stuff. Um, so you can see this dip. So why is there a dip around March 23rd, right? So like, um, you can say why, you know, are people, not, are people not walking around here? So we could take a look, uh, filter more, just in between those date ranges for the, the month of March, right? We can see that it's really close around the 21st to the 25th. <clears throat> um, all right, so, I was like, why, why would it, what, did my script fail or something that was running? And then I looked and it's spring vacation. It's like the end, towards the end of spring vacation. Um, so it kind of made sense. You can align some data collection with the fact that students were not coming to school. So this was at a university. All right. Um, and then, so the more scary of pieces, I can look at just me. So this is when I was in my office, right? So um, you can do that for, I can do that for anybody and you kind of know their name because it's their MacBook or their phone, right? Um, like so and so's iPhone, right? Um, so this is this is, I guess I'm a slacker in March, especially. So, um, 
So now we can get into the uh, the kind of architecture and design of Blue Cat, right? So one one awesome piece of it is it, it runs on. I've only really tested on Mac and Linux, um, but the Blue Cove library in which it sits runs on tons of different platforms uh, like Symbian, Android, and, and uh, um, Windows if you want to use that. So um, it works on Blues great. So that this is like the main advantage over using uh, a different library like there's like Pi Blues, but then you're stuck with Blues um, and you can't really use it on an I, um, on, a, on a Mac which I mean or, or anything in the future. It doesn't have this good abstraction layer because you're stuck in the Blues libraries. <laughs> All right, so the, it's it's pretty small. I mean, there are like a bunch of uh, Java files. It's Java based, so um, you can boo appropriately. But I don't know. I like Java. So, and then it kind of gets offloaded to a series of different jar files that contain native libraries for whatever platform you're on, right? So the the business logic, right, is all contained in the Java stuff, and then we just call based on the different platforms, uh, different libraries, and um, kind of arrange everything appropriately. So there's one main file and it'll run on like ARM Linux, uh, Mac 64-bit, um, uh, Linux 32-bit, 64-bit, Ubuntu, Fedora, all that stuff. All right, so here's one kind of diagram of how this stuff kind of will interact with everything. So you run Blue Cat, it sits on top of Blue Cove, it makes all those calls. And then if it's Mac, it just offloads it straight to the um, Apple API or it outputs everything to Blues if Blues is available. Uh, which will hit the Linux, um, you know, Bluetooth D, and the kernel modules, and then uh, whatever Linux is running on that implemented Blues, it'll work fine on, right? Uh, and then that, that'll actually hit the actual hardware. Um, <clears throat> so it's very versatile, which is by the design, so like a lot of people can use it. All right, so this is a eye chart. It's just the Blue Cove stack, the way it interacts with everything. Uh, I don't really want to uh, go over it too much, um, but Talk, but I want to talk about how the JNA, uh, JNI libraries work. All right, so Blue Cove specifically offloads stuff uh, using JNI libraries. So who's sort of JNI libraries before? All right, yeah, so I think they're pretty awesome because you can do all the business logic in, in, in Java and then, hmm, sorry. Oh, time, oh no. Okay, so first of all, how the fuck is that on the screen? Holy shit. Lots of people want to talk about lots of things. But oh we're my. Not gonna, we're oh not going to let that happen. Yeah. Oh my God, is that boring. I, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, it has a Bluetooth controller on it. Never mind. That's cool. All right. He said Java. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Double shot. All right. You all know the drill. Somebody, holy shit. All right, get up here, man. <laughs> hey, wait a second. Were you just in the last track we were in? <laughs> Is his name Sarah? Are you Sarah? Sarah. All right. Okay. Matt, what's your name? Uh, Atomic Waffles. What? <laughs> holy what? Atomic Waffles. <laughs> oh, it, thank you. It's, this is, everybody, this is Atomic Waffles. Atomic <laughs> Waffles, this is everybody. Hello. I'm lonely over here. I'm sure you are. I'm still, I'm hey, wait a minute. Oh, God. Where did you come from? That's Atomic Waffles. Jesus, don't you pay attention? <laughs> I just take the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> okay, slow down, champ. And what, you're going for a second one already? All right, everybody, you know the drill. Welcome to DEF CON. We'll see you soon. He's going to go back to the slide now. <laughs> Waffles got off the stage. I just. <laughs> what's, the, what's the time? I don't know. Okay. Oh. You take time. Keep Okay. We're right on time. Um, all right. So we have all this stuff to J and I. Uh, and. The way that that gets set up to, uh, to actually run on all these platforms is really just a script. So it's kind of like a dispatching script. So we just kind of weakly match the OS type of its Darwin, Linux uh, architecture, um, and spit it out. So if, if you want to use Bluecat and it's not supported on that architecture, um, I can just build all these libraries on your architecture uh, and wire it in if you want to use it, right? 
Okay. Um, so send me an email if that is the case. Uh, all right, and then we simply attach the libraries and then run uh, this, this main driver for the stuff. Uh, and then one, one problem, so if you look at this file and you're like, why is he filtering out the standard error? Uh, it's because some stacks output tons of debugging information to standard out and there's no way to shut it off. Uh, so I just filter it in, in, in some NS auto release mill pool on a Mac, it just, it's a spam thing. So this just fixes that. Um, cool, so uh, how does JNI work inside the libraries? All right, so somewhere in this Blue Cove program, right, when it, when it runs the text DOS uh, that it's running on and then loads the specific native libraries for it, um, it's going to search everything in the load library path, which is in de default inside the jar file, uh, to find whatever stack that it should be running on, right? So uh, once that's loaded up, it then has these extra um, native functions and they're ready to call, right? So you make a call to this, uh, our, our RF server get channel ID impl, right? So this is, this is something, it's a pretty low level thing, you have to get the handle for the specific connection. Um, and that gets offloaded to the C code uh, or whatever C++ code they want to use uh, in the native library, uh, which is declared like this with like a JNI header uh, to actually interact with that specific stack that you're running on, right? Uh, so you'll have to do this on every platform that it runs on. So I didn't do this. This is all the, the Blue Cove um, people, which I don't have. Their logo is on a different page. Uh, so they've done tons of work, and it seems like they all work for big companies anyway, so they're probably getting paid. Um, so that's good. Uh, and uh, thanks. Any any questions? I can take questions.